Híjole, la siguiente persona que voy a presentarles es una de las personas que más admiro porque me encantan los bienes raíces. Es una persona que tiene más de 11 mil propiedades y esta persona es Ken McEnroy, uno de los Rich Dad Advisors, una persona que realmente entiende cómo manejar la deuda, cómo manejar claramente los bienes raíces y por qué invertir en bienes raíces es una de las mejores opciones. No te lo puedes perder. Ken McEnroy contigo. Well, welcome back. And again, those of you who haven't met me before, you know that I'm Blair, one of the Rich Dad Advisors, author of three best-selling books in the area of team development, uh, sales development, and personal development too. And uh, it's an honor to be here. And thank you once again, Alfredo and Rosana, and your whole Divergentes team, the, a gargantuous task to put this whole thing together. And wherever you are, wherever you're watching this thing, Just type in, we love you in the chat box with lots of exclamation points. The more exclamation points, the more they're going to love it. Okay, so please do that. And, and hopefully you've gotten a ton of value from this. Uh, I know I have. And because um, right now you're to be thanked because the probably the best investment you can make right now, everybody's going to invest in this, invest in that. The best thing you invest in is your own education, and that's what, why you're here. And so thank you for doing that, and you should feel good about it. Um, the Rich Dad Advisor you're going to hear from today, you're going to talk about they, taking what's invisible, making it visible to you, uh, is Ken McElroy. Some of you may know him as the real estate guy, as part of the Rich Dad Advisor team, uh, which is true. Uh, he has an amazing company with over 8,000, maybe he'll update this, over 8,000 units across several states, uh, manages them amazing. When he raises funds for, for a project, it sells out like in minutes um, because they run such a tight ship. The other thing you might want to know about him too, even from my perspective, as a friend and a partner of his, is way more than a real estate guy. He is one of the best entrepreneurs I have met on the planet, okay? His company puts in thousands, his people put in thousands and thousands of hours to charity work in the community, uh, make sure that their tenants are happy, uh, have a, a truly, really hot business. And uh, anytime I have a challenge with uh, my business, I go to him, man, and he is like, he has 25 ways to skin any cat that I think there's no way to do it. <laughs> but he does and uh, he's a great person and he's a great teacher. So wherever you're at, give him a virtual round of applause for, for Ken McElroy. Thanks Blair. Great to be here. I obviously uh, big fans of uh, Alfredo and Rosanna and, you know, here to help and teach and help people learn and, and uh, you know, become financially free. You know, we learned it the hard way. I, I, I wish I would have had this, when I was, uh, you know, coming up through the ranks, but I, I just learned through lots and lots of failures. And um, so I'm, I'm happy to share, uh, you know, whatever I can to help people meet whatever goals they, they need. Yeah, well, thanks, Ken. You know, and, and your, your, your story, how you got into this is pretty interesting. I mean, you said you started part-time job or something working for a, a property manager. So if you could just step people through that real quickly, that'd be awesome. Yeah, you know, I, I got into university through athletics, and as you know, and, and uh, just what happened to be lucky there. My parents, uh, they, they never finished school. And I, um, you know, I, here, so all of a sudden, here I was. I didn't appreciate education, to be quite honest. I went there, you know, for wrestling. I was a, a wrestler. Uh, but, you know, in wrestling, man, there's only the Olympics, and that's it, man. I mean, you could win some – you could win tournaments and stuff like that, but after that, you're, you're pretty much – done you, i guess now you can go into ufc but um and some of my friends did do that but you know um i uh when i was managing an apartment building as i was finishing up a small little one and my friend asked you know he's like hey you, you know you want to manage this apartment building and i'm i'm like how hard can it be he's like all you got to do is collect rent you know <laughs> and uh, i was like oh well, how hard can that be <laughs> well as you can imagine it was hard and um You know, I ended up, um, uh, I ended up having to terminate the existing managers and clean the vacants and, you know, fill them up and, 
you know, I had a contracting and, and um, a construction background. So I basically did all the work thinking, oh, you know, I'm going to have to, this, you know, I want to get this thing full so I don't have to really manage it very, um, uh, you know, often. And uh, so I moved in and I did that. And, and the owner showed up a couple months later and he's like, hey, thanks for filling the, the thing up. <laughs> Where's all the money? You know, <laughs> and, uh, and I'm like, I'm on the wrong side of the desk here. You know, I, I need to be that guy. And that's actually how it started. I, I got my real estate license. Uh, I, I, I went to work for that property management company. I started managing bigger and uh, bigger properties. And then, um, you know, fast forward, I did that for eight, nine years. And then Blair, I just, one day I just bought a two bedroom, two bath myself with my own money. And then I did it again. And then I was out of money, you, you know? So I was like, okay, so now I have to figure out how to raise money, which I didn't know how to do. And then I had to uh, figure out how to do bigger deals, which I didn't know how to do. And I didn't know how to talk to a lender or any of that. And, and I just kind of learned, you know, as I, as I, as I grew, and as you know, now we're, um, yeah, I just never stopped. I never stopped acquiring assets, acquiring real estate. So we have lots of apartments. We have an office, we have self storage, you know, we do land development. Uh, we have 250 employees and uh, right around a billion dollars worth of assets uh, that we own. And uh, along the way, I met you guys and Robert and, you know, I was already rolling and, and, and Robert, I met them. I was raising money uh, from him and Kim and they invested in a deal with us and they've invested a lot of deals with us since. And, and uh, it's just been an incredible journey. And then, you know, then you don't know how to run a company, you know, so you have to figure that out um, and you have to figure out how to develop culture and hire right and keep people and keep everybody on track and mission and all that stuff. And so I just pour myself in, you know, personal development or whatever I could and uh, belong to anything that I could to improve, you know, my company and who I was personally. And um, that was it. You know, it was my journey. Just, just, just always trying to uh, soften those sharp edges. You know, we all have them. That's right. So I guess what you're saying, it's, it's not an overnight deal, uh, but entrepreneur, you know, you talk about entrepreneurship is that the, the, why you kept saying, I didn't know how to do that. 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 So, Again, Ken's going to talk about property, real estate, what he sees going on, and kind of his predictions of what's invisible out there for sure. But I want you to understand the, the journey, the, the journey we keep talking about going from E and S to B and I. What can you say about that journey? What's that journey like and who is it for? Well, I really like that quadrant, you know, ESBI, for a couple of reasons, because you can immediately see like where you are and, and where you were, perhaps. So for me, I was, you know, I was in the E quadrant right out of school, of course, and that, you know, that's what I thought I needed to be was an employee and get a job. And, you know, and actually I did, I, I, you know, I needed a way to, you know, pay for my car and pay for my rent and, and eat and all the things, you know, and hopefully some other things. And, 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 but then, you know, quickly you realize that, okay, this is a, you know, this is, you're kind of on this wheel and you kind of need to jump out and, and, you know, you know, what I, what I call eat what you kill, you know what I mean? So, and, and, uh, you know, so that's when I jumped out on my own and I was, okay, I got a bunch of business and that wasn't easy, of course, but then I eventually grew that. But then now it's all reliant on you, you know, all of a sudden you're a solid S and, and you know, the next step is to delegate all these clients and all these responsibilities and all these people and all these things, um, you know, to someone else and then grow it, you, you know, and then continue to stack on top of that. And, and, and I will tell you, uh, it's honestly never, um, I never stop, you know, trying to figure out how to be more efficient, um, and how to make the company better. And, and it's not, it's not really about the money, although obviously you have to make money while you're doing it. But, um, it, you know, for me, it's always just been about, uh, you know, how do you, how do you make, how do you make your investors the most money that you can, you know, cause I take incredible responsibility for taking their money. And so I need to make, that's the first thing on my mind all the time. And then the second one is, uh, are my employees. And then the third one, believe it or not, is, you know, if I take care of those two, then, then the rest is, it works out, you know, there, then there's enough money for, you know, for me and my partners and, and all of that. And you talk about, you know, how, how do you make the, 
the invisible, you know, visible, right? Um, you know, the truth is, you especially in real estate, you know, somebody can look at a corner on any street and see very different things, you know, as an example. You know, some people just see a vacant corner. Some people see, you know, a spot for a fast food place. Some people see an office building. Some see people see a storage building. Some people see multifamily. You, you know, like it just goes on and on and on. And each one has a different return. Each one has a different, um, you know, income uh, stream, a different expense stream. Uh, you know, they're all so different. And so, you know, that's actually what, you know, as I drive around, it drives me nuts because all I see is, oh, I can convert that yeah. or I can do that. You know what I mean? I, 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 you know, I drive into a vacant shopping center and I'm like, you know, I'm flipping all over the place. And I'm like, oh, okay, I can convert this into a warehouse. I can convert this into a self-storage. I can rip this down and build multifamily. And, you know, like, and so, so that's, you know, pe but other people just drive by all day long. And, and, and that's the difference of, you know, you have to kind of, earn that through education and getting through lots of discussions and lots of things. It's, you know, I mean, where some see, people see a farm, other people see a golf course. You know, it's just, it's just like, it's just how you see it. You know, it literally is, you know, taking something that no one else sees and creating it into something that, you know, uh, works out for everybody. So, that's awesome. So if, if, if I or one of the listeners are saying, you know, really, I want to get into real estate, because uh, we'll, we'll talk to the people that are already in real estate in a minute, but let's say I want to get into real estate. I just don't know where to begin. Um, I'd love to be able, I, I, I'd love to be able to see what other people don't see. What's the first thing they should be doing? What do you, what, what's the first? Yeah, steps? Uh, it's a great question because it's overwhelming. And at times, even for me, I get so much stuff into my inbox every day. Um, you, you know, in my opinion, I think people should start locally in areas that they know well, you know, and not even investing in different countries or, or different cities or different states where, you know, they don't have a management team or somebody that can, that can you know, can um, help them. Because that, that's, you know, there's nothing worse than getting on a plane and flying somewhere to try to fix a vacancy with somebody that you don't really have a lot of face time with. So, you know, so I would, I would say, you know, start locally, but then, you know, it can be as simple as, you know, there's a, uh, it, the signs are all there, Blair. And that's the thing. Like, like, as an example, we, we went to Tulsa, Oklahoma to, to find some real estate and it, there was a university that was kind of in this area that we liked based on the demographics. It was kind of a more fluid area and the university had a waiting list, but even more so they didn't have any housing, none. So here you had, you know, a, a university that was busted at the seams because everyone wanted to be there yet. There's no housing. So obviously fix the problem, you, you know, and so we started buying apartments you know, right around the university and voila, you know, they filled up with, with students. You know, there's, there's, you know, we have a massive, massive issue going on right now with um, the aging baby boomers, you, you know? And so, you know, you have that issue that you could solve. You, we have an affordability issue all over the world, especially in the United States. You know, you should, that's an issue you can solve. So you just have to look at, you know, how do you solve the problem? How do you solve the issue? And, you know, you're not gonna, what people do is they, they think it's like buying a stock, you know, and if I do this, I throw some money at something, you know, it's just gonna work out. Well, that's not how it works. You, there has to be a lot of thought, um, you know, uh, ahead of it. You, you know, I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna, I'm gonna take this and convert it to this, or, you know, or I'm going to build this or, or I'm going to repurpose this or, you know, there has to be some kind of a bigger plan around it. And, oh. and, and then that's how you raise money too. So what you're saying is, so what you're saying is start local. But then the other thing is, is as you take on a project, each project, it sounds like you're describing a business. So each project is kind of like its own business. You buy, you, you buy, you, are you buying a house or whatever? There's a whole business around it. There's income, there's expenses, there's a financial status, there's 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 bankers, there's 
attorneys. There's all that stuff, right? Is that is that what you're saying? Absolutely. Yes. And, and, and it can vary from block to block. You know, property taxes can vary literally from block to block. You, you know, neighborhoods can vary very differently from block to block, from submarket to submarket. You, you know, we all know, you know, don't, don't go to the bad area or whatever, you, you know. And so the good areas have, like good schools. So, so good schools attract, you know, people with families. They want to put their kids in good schools. And so naturally, you, you know, you, you're, you know, we did that in Plano, Texas, as an example. You know, this, this school district is, was one of the highest in Texas, and, and I, I think it's one of the highest in the nation. So, you know, people know that, that have kids. So they are going there. So we bought apartments in that area. So we're just solving the problem. We're trying to be, you know, you know take a look at the landscape and, and you know, try to, um, you know, accommodate what's already there, you know, as opposed to, you know, trying to push this rock uphill and make it into something that, that there's no demand for yet. <laughs> right. You know? Right. So the price is... The, the price of the property is only one small component compared to the, all the other, like you say, the invisible things going on around it that people should be, need to take a look at, right? Yeah, yeah. Like, you, like we all know, like, there's, there's areas that people go for the summer and the winter, as an example. You know, and sometimes that's boom and bust. So, you know, so you just got to, you know, that is what it is, you know, whether it's a ski area or a beach area, you know, but, but there's other areas like that, you know, that aren't, you know, that's super consistent and housing's low as an example, or, you know, as we drive around when, when Ross and I are looking at real estate, you know, development, you know, one of the biggest considerations is you know, how much develop, how much, you know, inventory is in the area. You know, it seems like a simple thing to, you know, to look for, but a lot of people don't, you, you know, they'll, like we've seen it in the self storage business, they just find a piece of land and build it. And then, you know, put a lot of pressure on their marketing team and their management team to fill it up. You know, if they would have looked, they would have seen that there's, you know, six or eight or 10 other co competing facilities within a two or three mile radius, you, you know, and, and, and there's, you know, so, so there's, it's a lot of it is common sense before you take the step. And, and uh, same thing with, you know, with, um, you know, the, the housing market, you know, people do things and, you know, they, they, they get in their heads that, you know, my rents are going to be this, I'm going to put a new kitchen in, I'm going to get another, you know, $500 a month or, you know, oh, that might, may or may not be true, you, you know, but they, they believe their own crap, you know, and all of a sudden, you know, they're caught with this thing and they're, ah, oh, real estate's not a good investment. Well, the truth is, is they didn't do their homework before. You know, and before I buy anything, before I do anything, Blair, I know the fiscal outcome at the end. I mean, I know what I'm going to pay. I know what I'm going to do with it. I know how I'm going to manage it. And I know I'm going to exit. And I know what I'm going to get my money back before we buy it. And now a lot of people. Important. Just say, say that again, because I don't think, I think people, like you say, get a little delusional about what it's going to do for them. And I'm going to make all this money. But that's part of what you got to do if you're going to if you're going to give a business plan to a bunch of investors. They want to see that's what they want to see. Right. Well, right. If I if I ask you for money, you're going to pull out of something that's making money, even if it's a bank account. It's not making very much. But the point is, is you want it to make money. So, you know, you have to make sure that those things happen. And so so whenever we're looking at anything, as an example, like right now, I'm looking at buying an existing property. It's $34 million, and there's a nine-acre piece right next to it. So the goal is to buy an ex this existing property and then build, you know, the we'll probably get around 120 more units, uh, and then we'll combine it, you know, and, and we don't have to build an extra clubhouse. We don't have to build an extra pool. You know, there's all these extra things that, you know, we're going to save a couple million dollars on the development itself on the nine-acre piece. That's seeing something, you know, that's actually taking one owner, buying for 34 million and taking another owner, combining the two. And, and you know, and so the, you know, investors can wrap their head around that, you, you know, okay, yeah, that makes sense. You don't have an extra, you don't have to spend all these infrastructure costs, you know, on this new nine acre piece. All you got to do is basically slap 120 more units on and knock down the wall. <laughs> you know what I mean? And, and make it one big project and all of a sudden it raises the value and the, and the price of the, of the one that I bought 
because now I've got one that's brand new sitting right here and over a three or four years period of time, you know, nobody's going to know. It's going to be, you know, I mean, it'll be different years of construction, but it'll be a project that, you know, was built in 2021 or 2022. And, uh, you know, and so, so those are the kinds of things that, 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 you know, the people are making money, they see, you know, and, and so, to, to, you know, so I know exactly what I'm going to pay. I know exactly what I'm going to raise. I know exactly uh, how long it'll take to build it. I know exactly how long it'll take to fill up and stabilize. I'm going to estimate what I can get on the loan and the exit and when I'm going to give the investors their money back. And that's all part of my plan before I even do, them. you know, you have to, all that stuff has to be super thought out before you even start. You can't just buy something and hope. And that's what a lot of people do. You know, that's the difference between capital gain and cash flow. You know, as you know, I'm a cash flow guy. Right. So I like to, I like to, I like to accumulate, generate cash flow, and then have a bunch of passive income so that I don't have to do deals. I don't want to have to do deals to pay my bills. You know, I want the, my reoccurring revenue to pay my bills and I want my tenants to pay off my buildings, you know, and take advantage of all the tax uh, you know, strategies that come with real estate. And that's what, that's what I try to do. You know, a lot of people, they'll buy something for a hundred or 200 or 500 and they hope it goes up, you know, and then it doesn't. And they're, you know, cause the market corrects or we have COVID or whatever it is. And all of a sudden they're like, ah, real estate was a horrible deal. I'm going to stick my money back into the stock market or, you know, and it, and then that goes know, down so, too, because they didn't do market research on that either. Yeah. <laughs> Right, right, exactly right. So exactly why I don't invest in the stock market is because I don't understand it. I just don't understand it, you know. And, and so, I mean, I, I probably could if I dove into it. I, I would probably be much better at it. But but I do understand, you know, okay, I got a vacant building. I put a tenant in it. It's worth more. Like, you know what I mean? <laughs> like, it's, you know, you buy a vacant building for a million bucks. You put a tenant in it. You know, it's definitely worth more, especially – you know, if you want to sell it, somebody's going to buy something that's fully packaged up. That's, you know, a hundred percent leased, you know, like a Walgreens or a CVS or a pharmacy or a grocery store or whatever it might be versus a vacant piece of land, you know, with a building on it, you, you know, it's just going to be less. And right. so it's not, you know, you know, it's what you see. It's taken the, you know, as I drive by things and I look, it's a it drives me nuts. Right? I, I just can't, I look at like things all the time, you know, I'm looking at corners, I'm, I'm taking pictures of people's signs and, you know, calling them up and, you know, I wonder if I can convert this into that or, you know, so that's all I do all day long is, and, and most of the deals uh, I don't do. But that's how I got into the, that's how I got into the billboard business, you know? Yeah. Well, exactly. you were, you were telling me at one point that you were saying that the number of deals that you and Ross look at, on an annual basis is, is unbelievable, you know, and that the number of, and the number of, of deals that you actually do out of that is amazing. Just give them those numbers. Yeah. Well, I think, um, you know, when, when we, when we were fully rolling, we were, we were probably, we would probably look at uh, at least 50 deals in a couple week period and um, <clears throat> probably make offers on uh, maybe two or three, and then, um, you know, if we were lucky, we would be buying five or six or seven a year. Yeah. So if you like doing market research and you like no nosing around and looking at those things and, and that's, then that may be the asset class for you. Now, you, you know, Ken's written a couple books. Here's one of them. ABC's a real, real estate investing and kind of outline how you go about this project, particularly if you're doing it for the first time. You want to speak to that for a second? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and so I, I'm a, you know, I, I think that you should start small, start local, make small mistakes, um, and, and just respect the fact that you don't know anything. <laughs> you know, and that's actually the, one of the bigger issues. I think, you know, people go, oh, Ken said you should invest in real estate, so they go do it. You know, that's, you know, they should invest in real estate, cash flowing real estate for cash flow. But if they don't know how to do it and they don't, you know, you, you talk a lot about team. You have to, you have to find it, make sure you're not overpaying, make sure that you uh, understand what the rents are and the expenses, make sure you understand what the taxes are, make sure you understand how to, 
uh, talk to a lender. And the truth is, while that might be scary and daunting for the first timer, it's not that hard. It's like buying a car or, you know, or, or you know, get on the phone with, you know, a homeowner and getting your, uh, you know, getting a new insurance policy or changing insurance agents and just asking a lot of questions and getting quotes. It's the same process. So, you know, it's just that people haven't done it. And um, I was talking to two guys yesterday on Zoom, and they're both NFL, uh, pretty famous NFL athletes. And they're, um, you know, buying some real estate in Atlanta, you know, and they, um, you know, they have money, uh, but very smartly, they're, you know, they're, they're trying to figure out and they're, they're, you know, how to build their team, how to, how to make good decisions on the underwriting and make sure they do the market selections correctly and all that. And, um, and that's kind of part of the process. Is, and then eventually you become that expert, you know, as you, as you, as you meet with multiple lenders and you start talking through term sheets and you start getting loans and you close a deal and then you close another deal. They don't have to be big deals. Then you all of a sudden start to know the questions to ask and, you know, just all of a sudden the, 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 the tides shift a little bit for you. And it's the same thing on, uh, you know, and then for me, I just started doing bigger and bigger, and bigger deals, but you, you don't have to, it's the exact same process. Buying a single family home and buying a $50 million apartment building are the exact same process. It, the only thing that's really different is the, the due diligence on a big project is more extensive, but everything else, you have to get a loan, you have to set up an LLC, you have to raise the money, you know, um, you, you know, and actually the management on a bigger project is easier because on a single family, you know, it's more difficult. You know, you have one one move out. We have one vacancy. You know, yeah, I mean, you're 100 percent. You're 100 percent empty. Yeah. <laughs> right. So as you get as you as you start to grow momentum and you start to get bigger bigger deals, then what happens is, you know, you actually have you're hiring more sophisticated management teams and you know people that are literally studied this kind of stuff and they're working for you now and they're running your projects for you. You know, that's what we have now. And so that's why it's uh, now what I do is I just find deals and throw them into the company. Basically, yeah. you know, I used to have to do all those other pieces, which are really important because now when I'm sitting down with somebody, I understand it, you know, every step. And that's the important piece. This is not like throwing a stock, not throwing stock money or, you know, to a wealth manager. This is literally, um, you know, getting your hands dirty and understanding every single piece of the process. Oh. Yeah, so what you're saying is that the path to becoming uh, a, a good real estate investor, a good real estate developer, whichever portion you want to take, it's all about education. It's just about getting educated, but you know, knowing nothing in the beginning and admitting that you know nothing, which for some people is very difficult to do, um, and, being, and being able to ask the right questions. And with one deal comes the next one, and, and you learn a lot on one deal. Just, yeah, I always, I always tell people, I go, why is it a fireman could run into a burning house, you know, and they're like, I don't know why, I go, because they've been training for it. And that's the difference. You know, they're, they're, you know what I mean? Like, I would scare me to death. Okay, it's the same thing. You know, once you're trained for it, once you start to see it, then you start to see, you know, things, you, you know how to manage it, you know how to manage it better. It's super scary in the beginning. But you know, there are things, there are people like in the military, I mean, there's incredibly well-trained people out there and they're doing their jobs based on training. You know, even people that are doing whatever they're doing right now, you know, whether it's an assistant or a, you know, sales manager or a salesperson, you know, it's all training, you know? And so when they're sitting down in front of a client, they have tools in their tool belt to be able to do their jobs. And it's the same with real estate. It's the exact same. It's just they don't know how to do it yet because they haven't done it. Yeah. Well, and you know what, you guys, uh, if, if real estate is something you want to look at, um, Ken not only has written some great books, but if you go to KenMcElroy.com, and you'll see that in the in the chat box, is KenMcElroy.com, he's got a library of videos on how to's and real estate and more questions than we could ever answer in five days. Um, and go check it out, KenMcElroy.com. He's also, you can find on YouTube, he's blowing up YouTube right now. Um, and he's become quite a, quite a great marketer. 
when it comes to that. But one of the th reasons is because he sees things that other people don't see, or he sees things that other people don't want to see. Maybe that's, maybe that's more accurate. So just to, as best you can, kind of tell everybody what you see going on 2020, 2021, what's ha what, what is it you see and why? Sure. Well, that's a big question, you know, but uh, I'll do my best. Uh, you know, so you have to, what I always like to say is, you know, let's, let's, let's get away from the opinions and the gut feelings and the, the comments that don't hold any weight, you know, so you got to go right to the numbers. And what I always say to people, you know, go to the math, what is the real math? And, and so specifically in the United States, you know, we have somewhere between, uh, I've seen 6 million, 8 to 9 million people that have not paid their mortgages, as an example. It's called forbearance, you know, so they're delinquent. And, and uh, two and a half million of them are 90 days delinquent. Okay, so that's one subset. Another one uh, are the evictions. You know, as everybody's lost their jobs, you know, all over the, all over the world, you know, somebody's the landlord, somebody's holding the paper, the, the mortgage. And if, if a renter's not paying the landlord, then the landlord's not paying the lender. And guess what? Somebody's holding the mortgage. So the lender's not paying somebody that holds the mortgage. So it trickles all the way up, which is tr typically the people. It's usually managed money anyway. So, um, you know, so all that's happening. And so in the U.S., we're, we're facing somewhere around 30 million evictions. So, so you have that issue. Then you have the unemployment issue, which right now, if you look at the February numbers to basically last week, we're, we're at a $12.5 million, million person deficit. So you have 12 and a half million people out of work. You have, you know, call it 8 million people that haven't paid their mortgages and you have 30 million people um, facing eviction. So what does that mean? That's, those are real numbers. That's math. So, so, you know, you, you, and of course, the, a lot of states and uh, countries are still closed and they're not allowing commerce and, you know, so all that's continuing to happen. And then you have a lot of businesses shutting down. So what, what does that mean? To me, what that means is there's going to be a tremendous amount of inventory that's going to hit the market in the next two years. Tremendous amount. Because, as a renter doesn't pay, the landlord doesn't pay, the lender doesn't get paid, they move through this foreclosure process. And that's going to, you're gonna, we're gonna see a tremendous amount of real estate hit the markets, which is gonna drive prices down. Now, it's gonna be submarket to submarket, it's not gonna be universal, it's never, you know, in the universe, it's never in the US, it's, it's always in a, you know, submarket by submarket basis. So you do have to get educated to see um, you know, if it if it's if it's happening in in your particular area, but you know, you have to always look at you know what's the unemployment rate in an area, you know, because those are people they're either spending money or not spending money, and then you have to look at the inventory, and then you have to look at the long term plan. So, it, is it is it is an industry shutting down? Like like is it like I I I I met with a guy yesterday. He has a manufacturing company. He was actually literally doing 47, um, 737s a month, his, his company. And now he's doing two. Yeah, he was doing all the plastics and all the stuff in the cockpits. And he's doing two. So he went from 47 a month to two. This is just one guy, I understand. But it's story after story after story after story where people have laid off some of their staff. And, um, you know, not to be a, a, a downer, but you have to look at these facts. You know, they're real. And um, so there's real people in pain. There's real people that um, don't have a lot of savings. And so my prediction is that we're going to have a housing crash. And, you know, and people have changed the way they buy things. There's, I don't know anybody that doesn't buy online. So, you know, retailers are having a problem, malls are having a problem, commercial offices having a problem, you, you know, and I think multifamily long-term is going to be fine. But I do think that there's going to be a fair amount of loan defaults unless the governments come up with some programs to, you know, prop them up again. 
But, you know, when somebody doesn't pay, if there's a whole ripple effect of people that don't get paid. And, and there's ramifications. Uh, and, and so all of that, I think, is going to work itself out after the election and, you know, throughout next year and even probably the next. And, you know, and then the economy is just, you know, it's not like starting a car and going 100 miles an hour again because we're going 100 miles an hour. And, um, you know, now we're, we're basically trickling along. And so, you know, just because there's a vaccine and, you know, and people are starting to go back to normal uh, does not mean that uh, the behavior is not going to change. You know, they're still going to be super cautious on, on like cruise lines and airlines and hotels and, you know, all those things. And, you know, RV sales are way up. I don't know if you've seen, like, <clears throat> you can't get a space in an RV park and RV sales are going, you know, people are still wanting to travel but they want to do it by themselves, you know, in a car. So, you know, it's very interesting times. And, and I think that, you know, the best thing to do is get super educated right now, be very specific, uh, pick a lane and, and really understand it, you know, and, and, and then, um, and be, you know, be the expert in that area, wherever you are, and then deals will start to come with you because you'll start to recognize them. You know, but but it's it, there's no sense in catching a falling knife right now. And I think the knife is falling and, you know, you don't want to catch it midstream. You want it to, you, you know, you, you want it, you want the, 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 you want the, you want to buy the deals from the banks, you know, after the banks have already taken the haircut on them. And, you know, because you make your money when you buy. And, and the goal is not to sell. The goal is to buy it. Cash flow, cash flow, refinance, refinance, tax free. Use use the tax laws and get your money back tax free and keep the asset. That's the whole goal. Not to not to time the market because once you do, and I did this, you know, early in my career, I had, I bought a whole bunch of stuff, a couple thousand units, sold them, and and by the you know by 2005, I didn't own anything. I was like, oh, okay, I just spent all this time, made a bunch of money. Spent all this time, you know, finding all these deals, and developing all these deals in the condominiums at the time. And, um, you know, at the end of 05, I basically hardly had any real estate left. I was like, okay, so now I got to go do this again, right? So you're better off. I wish I would have held all those. I always ask people, I go, you know, how much is your childhood home worth? <laughs> the one you grew up in. Don't you wish you still owned it? Like, <laughs> you know, right? Yeah. Yeah, like, you know, it, it's... You know, inflation's going to push up, and uh, you know, and, and inflation is going faster, certainly than um, the interest rate you're going to borrow. So you might as well borrow money. You know, if you could borrow less than inflation, why wouldn't you? Right, right. Wow. So again, what you guys is what what Ken's telling you is what most people don't see, and but what he gave you is the clue, and that is. Stop listening to the hype. Stop watching the news. Stop listening to politicians and all that stuff and look at the numbers. Go look at the math. Hopefully you can believe the math, but there are source, reliable sources for that. And the, the, the num just like buying a deal is what Ken's saying, is buying the deal is a, it's about knowing the numbers, about if you're good, what your future plan is going to look like. It's all about the numbers, and you got to get used to that. That's kind of what you're saying, yeah? Yeah, and that, that actually is the invisible. A banker, here's the cool part. Bankers don't want deals back, but they do get them back. And so, you know, they're, they're looking at their toxic balance sheet and which affects their future lending. And so, you know, and, and at the end of the day- so, well, hold on. Explain what a toxic balance sheet is real quick. So, yeah, so a lender, uh, let, let's, say, let's say I give um, Blair a loan and he can't pay and I take it back. Well, now I have the real estate that's attached to the loan because the real estate is the collateral for the loan. So I get Blair's house back and, and uh, now I have a loan that I gave to him that's come back. That's a negative rating for a bank. And so the bank, uh, you know, the banker, you know, listen, if they were in the business, they would, they would be doing this, but they're not. And so what happens is the bankers, uh, they get these assets and uh, you know you want to go you want to go take care of those assets you want to go help the bank right that's what you want hey babe we're in the middle of a zoom sorry hold on Blair it's okay 
All right. So the bank is, um, you know, so the banks are getting these assets and uh, the bankers are sitting there. The only thing that they're trying to do is get rid of these assets so that they can make more loans. That's how banks make money. They, they loan to the people with good credit so they can get paid back. And the ones that they take back are uh, going to hurt them. Right, because nobody's, no, nobody's yeah. paying on them. The whole yeah. idea. So, so you could be, yeah. So you could be the savior. Roll in, take these toxic assets off the bank's hands, but you have to know what to do with them. You know, you can't just buy a toxic asset and they don't have a plan for it. But if you can buy something from a lender, something that's been foreclosed, something from a bank, or something that's in trouble even before it gets to that point, for a discount, that's how you make money. That's awesome. So what you're saying is there's a there's a crash coming, but there's a huge opportunity. There's huge opportunities out there. But now's the time to start learning about it. Yeah. So it's the opposite of what you think. So when when the market's going like this and everybody's talking about it and, and it's in the news and the rents are growing up and all that kind of stuff and everybody's making hay and everybody's making money, that's the time when you should be really look, taking. You're raising your eyebrow and going, oh, okay, what am I missing? You know, and it's the opposite. You want to go, you want to, you want to do that after, um, you know, everything's crashed and you want stuff to be, you know, at their, at the bottom, you know, and, and bumping around and you do not want a lot of buyers. You do not, you do not want a lot of competition as you're trying to buy assets. You know, right now, you know, it's not uncommon for us to have 30, 40 bidders on a project, you, you know, and um, you know, back when I started buying in 2005, 2006, and, and then after the crash in 2008, there was, we were, we were the only one. The bank was like, oh, you guys will take this off our hands? It's very different, you know? And, and so that's because people lost a lot of money. You, you know, there wasn't a lot of money floating around and, uh, and the banks were taking on assets. And so the banks were trying to get rid of these things so it wasn't giving them a negative rating. And so it's, it's the opposite of what you think. Awesome. Wow. This is, uh, again, for you VIPs that get the opportunity to watch this thing again, watch this one again, because just a ton, ton of good stuff here. Um, as we start to bring this, wrap this thing up, Ken, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to switch to entrepreneurship for a second, because you made a prediction about you know, the real estate market and what other people aren't seeing, and it's all based on the numbers. So based on the numbers or whatever you see, what's your advice for entrepreneurs or somebody that's trying to start a business? I don't want to, I don't want to spend a lot of time on it, but I think it's a hidden nugget of what you do. I think one of the books you wrote was, um, you wrote a book on entrepreneurship, didn't you? Sleeping Giant, yeah. That's right, Sleeping Giant. And it was some amazing stories of, of entrepreneurs and how, they, they, they start, some start with nothing and be able to make and did great things, correct? That's right. Yeah. And so, so what happens is, he, here's the deal, Blair, what a, when an economy goes down, not in every case, but this is, this is when you really see who's really good at running their companies. That's actually what you see. And so the, the people that don't have cash reserves, the people that don't have multiple lines of income, the people that aren't, don't have a social media presence, the, the people who don't have you know, ways to make money other than people walking through the door, those are the people that lose their businesses. You know, all the stuff you teach. And so, you know, as a business owner, you have to have multiple hooks in the water at all times. You have to expect a downturn. And, and so, you know, so I think what you'll see is you'll see some really good concepts that don't make it. And so it's an opportunity to go in and take a look at, and the reason most good concepts don't make it is management and cash. And, and, and you know, and, and I mean, I've seen so many, I've seen, I've seen franchises that are super easy that have fighting ownership, you know, and so their sales are low, right? And I've seen, I've seen the independent, you, you know, that's uh, super entrepreneurial and they're killing it, you, you know? So it's not the name, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's the team, you know, and, the, and, the, and, uh, and so I think, you know, you're going to see, you, you're going to see a lot of um, fallout as a result of, and they're going to say, oh, the, you know, COVID took me down, you know? Uh, but I'm telling you, I've seen, I saw a friend of mine 
um, you know, he's like, you know what? Like, this is an opportunity to go this direction. And same company, but now they're, he's off doing different product lines. And already his sales are up because everyone's home and everybody's buying. And he went into the dog crate manufacturing business, as I, as I, as I think you know. And so, you know, but he was, he was manufacturing uh, heaters for the art, uh, art you know, um, the uh, uh, RVs, you know, Polaris and Honda and Mastercraft boats and all that stuff, he's, the actual heaters. And, and so now he's making dog crates, you know, because he's like, oh, people are home with their pets. The, the shelters are out of, of pets, you know, now that everybody's home. So, so now he's been killing it, you know, so, so it's, it's, it's being flexible. And, 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 and not, you know, saying, oh, my God, because the truth is, his heater business is not doing well. People, you know, um, you know they, they pull back, you know, when, they're, uh, when, they, when they lose their jobs. And so, you know, so he did that, and sure enough. And so it's those, you know, it's, it's being adaptable and flexible and, and being able to, again, have a, a broader view and not just take this, you know, you know this, this – is one 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 view and seeing what you don't see, you know, seeing the making the uh, the invisible visible, you, you know, because there there are lots of things people can do, and there are needs right now that people are, um, um, you know, they're emerging. You know, we're we're already starting to see it. So you know, this 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 whole thing is has created um, lots of new, new opportunities, you know, and you see things that were struggling before, like Uber Eats is on fire, as an example, you know, and so, so you start to see things emerge that it's, it's pretty exciting, actually, you know, it's, it's horrible to see people go through this and lose money, but, but at the, at the same token, there's a way uh, to capitalize on it, too, just, you just don't want to be a pioneer, that's right. Well, I think the way you said is really true is that, and, which is common with what you said about real estate investing. And that is, is to be constantly searching for the, for opportunities, to, looking at what's out there. You don't have to have, I, what you're saying is you don't have to have, you said you don't want to be an, uh, a pioneer. That was it. You say, you don't have to have the original idea. Cause you might, if you're like me, I don't think I've ever had an original idea in my life. Okay, but but there's a lot of good ideas that people don't do anything with. Or there's a lot of good ideas that spur other good ideas. So what you're saying is, if I can see one of my favorite midtown Manhattan rest steakhouses got shut down through COVID-19, you know, and they uh, they were going to go out of business like everybody else. And they go, no, they just turn their dining room into an extended kitchen and storeroom and prep room, and they deliver gourmet steak dinners all over Manhattan and they're crushing it and they're not going to go back to doing what they're doing because their overhead's lower. It's, it's, it's easier to do. It's all, all systemized. It's, it's awesome. So you're right. Yep. I mean, there's lots of opportunity. I, I always tell somebody, I go, solve the problem, period. Like, what is the problem? How can you make life easier for somebody? And then solve that problem and just get out in front of it. That's what Uber did, you know, with the taxis. If you go back, remember when you had to call a taxi and sit on a corner, not in New York, you don't, but in a lot of places, you, you know, you'd have these long waits. Uber solved the problem. That's what they did. And by the way, Uber started during the last recession. Interesting, I didn't know that. Yeah, so, so you know, it doesn't have to be Uber, but it could be, you know, just solve the problem, whatever that might be. It could be around healthcare. You know, it could be around the aging population. It could be around affordable housing. It could be around food. It doesn't really matter. You know, it could be around pets, as my friend did. You, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. 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 I mean, he's making so, a killing on these uh, pets with, that have high anxiety because they've been in the pound. And he's, you know, and he's selling these high anxiety dog crates. And he's, you know, they're, they're selling for 1200 each. And he's, kill, he's killing it. You know, he's selling them all over the country. And he only has two salespeople. Yeah, I know. I know. I, know. I talked to him, and it just blows my mind. But his, their whole pitch, I mean, which brings back, obviously, to the piece I talked to you guys about is that your number one skill is your ability to sell. Um, and so right now, if you're an entrepreneur and you, don't, and you, want, to, if you want to be in business and you want to be in property and real estate, I'm going to recommend a little plug, learn how to sell. Because you're going to need that in anything that you do in the world of business and in life 
for that matter. Um, so anyway, Ken, this has just been amazing and, and thank you for contributing to this whole thing. Um, again, if people want to get a hold of you, you go to KenMacroy.com, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know what I did is I prepared a bunch of videos because people have questions on entrepreneurship and, and real estate, and I didn't have time to answer them one-on-one. -on -one. So I did videos and put them up on the website for people so that they could go and learn. And Because uh, a lot of the questions are the same, and I appreciate the questions, but it was easier just to address it and then stick it up on there. And then we have forums up there, and we have um, a podcast, and you know, obviously the YouTube channel, all that stuff. So there's so many ways to learn for free. Uh, I just think you know, that's, that's what you need to do is, is follow the right people and, um, and follow teachers that are actually doing, you know, what they're saying. That's the other thing. Be, be very careful of uh, who your teachers are. That's right. Well said. Well said. So again, that, Ken, thanks for doing this. Um, any, fi any final words? I mean, kind of gave a final word, but any final words for all those people out there? In, yeah. In, in, in I, I Mexico and think... Latin America? Yeah, I, I think, you know, it's okay to, um, to grieve a little bit and be a little bit depressed about what's happening, and, you know, um, and that's part of the process, but, but you can't stay there. You, you know, you have to, you know, dust yourself off and, and, and look for ways to uh, survive. And uh, if you can do it and take care of people and solve somebody else's problem and benefit from that, what better can you do? You, you know, you, you shouldn't be looking at it as just trying to take advantage. You're literally solving somebody's issues um, and making their life a little bit better while everyone's going through this. So that's what I would have to say. All right, man. Well, thanks. And uh, thanks for, for doing this from beautiful Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. And uh, it's good, good to see you be, see be back in Phoenix soon. So again, thank you so much. Again, Rosanna and uh, Alfredo, thank you so much for giving us the opportunity to teach because at the end of the day, leaders are teachers and, um, and you just heard from one of the great ones. Okay, so thanks again, Ken. You bet. Cheers. Espero que te haya gustado muchísimo este video y no te olvides de suscribirte y activar las notificaciones. Deja tus comentarios o preguntas porque me encanta leerlos y contestarlos. Todos. Que Dios te cuide.